We're good? Yeah? Well, hi. Good evening. <laughs> My name's Debbie. I am the family minister here at Isle of Faith and one of four leaders who rotate giving the messages every Wednesday evening. Um, I ask for your uh, forgiveness here. I'm going to sit and chat with you because um, I have an injured back and I really can't stand and move around and stuff, so I'm, I'm hoping that's okay uh, for you guys. Forgive me. Thank you. Thank you. Because we are talking about forgiveness tonight. Yes. We are in week two of our sermon series, What's Your Superpower? It's kind of a trick question uh, because superpowers we're talking about aren't really unique to individual. I can't go up and say, Renee, what's your superpower? And get the right answer that I'm looking for and get a different answer from Aaron over here because it's the same for all of us. All of us have these gifts, this superpower that God gave us that we can invoke. They're universal across the board. Um, they're powers that help us to love God, to love ourselves, to love others more fully. So last week, we learned about the power of the tongue, the superpower. Kevin, or speech man, shared how the words we use can build up or tear down. We are carrying um, the fun spirit of October uh, into November with a superhero theme. That's where this uh, speech man came from. And speech man told us that our words that we use, they steer us like a rudder, right? This week, we're going to turn to another superpower. So we are going to talk about the power to forgive, the power to reconcile, and the power to block offense from hitting its target. Captain Forgiveness. I think I have a picture. Yes, there's Captain Forgiveness. Captain's a, a she, by the way. I think, I think that looks a lot like me, uh, just in my head. In my head. Yes. Right, honey? Yeah. Yeah. She might have another name. I don't really know comic superheroes or anything, so you guys may know her as something else. I hope she's not offended. But um, for tonight, she's Captain Forgiveness. Uh, Romans 3.23 tells us, uh, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So try as we might, there are times when we are going to fall short in our speech and our actions. I know some of you came last week and you heard Speech Man give you all kinds of of good advice and good information and you, and you left here and you were going to go 24-7. You were going to be perfect in your speech. And I know that you failed. I'm sorry, shocker, I'm pretty sure you failed. Because each of us are going to offend. Whether we do it intentionally or unintentionally, we're going to fall short. So I want you right now to look at the person to your left and if it's a blank chair, talk to your invisible best friend. But I want you to look to your left and tell that person, I am human. Okay? I want you to turn to the right. And I want you to tell that person, I will fall short. There you go. Now we're going to look up and we're going to tell God, I need you. And tell him, help me to see where I have offended and where I have been offended. All right. All joking aside, why don't you pray with me, okay? Uh, gosh, Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight, God. I thank you uh, for loving us. I pray, Lord, that whether we have been offended today or years ago and have built up walls of hurt, or that whether we have done the offending, God, I just pray that you help each one of us to just soak that in and bring to mind where it's at in our lives, God. I pray for those walls to be broken down. I pray for forgiving spirits to prevail. I pray for your love to prevail. In the name of Jesus, I pray. All right. Ouch. That hurt my feelings. I may need Captain Forgiveness. Yeah. Okay. 
Dun, da, da, da. <laughs> all right. I'm Captain Forgiveness. Let me tell you what I'm all about. Up on the screen here is my motto, my mantra, what I live for, what I am. So forgiveness is the intentional and voluntary process by which a victim undergoes a change in feelings and attitude regarding an offense. Let's go of the negative emotions, such as vengefulness, with an increased ability to wish the offender well. What I'm not about. Forgiveness is different from condoning, failing to see the action as wrong. It's different from excusing, holding the offender as, not holding the offender as responsible. It's different from pardoning, such as what a judge or a president might do. It's different from forgetting, which is removing awareness of the offense. And it's also different from reconciliation, which is the restoration of a relationship. That's what it isn't, but we're gonna talk tonight about what it is. But you know what, as Captain Forgi Forgiveness, I really care about restoring relationships, so we're really gonna talk about that too. We're gonna add that back in. So first, first part of, our, of my mantra is the intentional and voluntary process. See, we are made with free will. We can choose to love, we can choose to hate, we can choose to do right, we can choose to do wrong. We have freedom to do so because God gave us that freedom. We do, however, have the consequences of those choices, for good or for bad. I can choose not to forgive, I can choose to hold a grudge. What happens when I do this with my wonderful husband and daughter, Mike and Jamie? And how long can I really go without forgiving them? And what are the consequences of not doing so? But I can also choose to voluntarily forgive. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. In researching the subject tonight for, about forgiveness, um, I, I got um, on the internet and started doing you know, some searches and found a lot of different studies about um, findings that research scientists had about uh, forgiveness. And they did um, studies for, with people who were, um, had some really um, difficult offenses made towards them, you know, including murdering um, a loved one. And um, all the studies that I found um, really summed up to say that people who were taught how to forgive became less angry, felt less hurt, were more optimistic, became more forgiving in a variety of situations, became more compassionate and more self-confident. The studies showed a reduction in the experience of stress, a, the phys physical manifestation of stress, and an increase in vitality. There's a saying we say a lot around, around here, and hurting people hurt others. After hearing Mike and Jamie mock me, I'm really likely to go into work here and be cranky, and I might snap at one of you. And one of you is then gonna go home cranky as well and probably snap at somebody in your household. And then you know what, that person's probably gonna go to school or work the next day and they're gonna be a little on edge and they're gonna snap there. It's a ripple effect. It goes on and on, but how do we stop it? It stops with forgiveness, the sooner the better. It is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to take back those ripples. But there's good news. People can be taught how to forgive, and that's what we're going to do tonight. It doesn't come natural. It is learned. When we learn how to forgive, we can, take, we can make intentional decisions to do so. We can understand that the power of forgiving frees our souls and heals our bodies. That a forgiving spirit leads to a compassionate spirit. We can voluntarily choose to be a forgiver. We can choose to exercise our forgiveness muscles it's easier said than done, though. So how do we forgive the person who gossiped about me and ruined my reputation? The person who didn't check on me when I was sick? The person who mocked me in front of others, in person or perhaps in social media? How do we forgive the person who stole from me? The boss who fired me? The person who betrayed me? What about the person who belittled me? the person who didn't encourage me, the person who crushed my dreams? What about 
how do I forgive the person who raped me or the person who murdered my loved one? How do we forgive the person in the mirror who failed yet again? How do we forgive a God who let all this happen? I'm using kind of um, a silly example tonight with Mike and Jamie. Um, but please know that I'm really not making light of your hurts. Because when we're offended, it hurts. And I know that some of you um, sitting out here tonight um, are hurt, you know, have an offense um, that might be fresh, it might be old, but it, but it hurts. We all need Jesus. Jesus teaches us how to forgive. The more we follow his teaching, the more we practice forgiving, the more it becomes a part of us. Churches split and families divide. Marriages shatter. Love dies, crushed by an onslaught of words launched in hurt and frustration. Offended by friends and family and leaders, words sharpened by bitterness and anger, they all aim a deadly, bolt, a deadly blow to our souls. Even if the information is correct and accurate, often the motives are impure. Any, any sowing of discord or separation among us is an abomination to God. That's from Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. It's an abomination to God. That's why we care, and that's why we're talking about this tonight. That's why it matters why we must intentionally choose to forgive because God wants us to. Let's go to the next one. The victim undergoes a change in feelings and attitude regarding the offense. Changing our feelings and attitude is a process. It takes time. Sometimes the bigger the offense, the longer it takes, but not always. You know, I recall a few years ago when a gunman opened fire in an Amish community and, and killed an Amish youth. That very day, the Amish parents went immediately to the gunman's family and let them know that he was forgiven by them. That very day. It's less about the size of the offense than the size of our forgiveness muscle. Many people are unable to function properly in God's purpose and calling for our lives because of the wounds, hurts, and offenses they are handicapped and hindered from fulfilling their potential. Most often, hurt from a fellow believer causes them to stay like King David did in Psalm 55. For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man my equal, my companion, my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walk to the house of God in the throng. In other words, a stranger could have called me cray-cray, walked through here, and I probably wouldn't have cared. But when it's people who I love most, it cuts like a knife, it hurts. It's those who care about us the most that can hurt us the most. Yet most believers are shocked and bewildered when someone close to them offends them. Offended people hurt, and their understanding is darkened. We begin to judge others by assumption, by appearance, and hearsay, we fall into the sin of critical spirit. We blow things up way beyond what they really are. We make them bigger. We seek out people who will come to our side, whether or not there really is a side to take. Pride will often keep us from admitting our true condition. Pride causes us to view ourselves as victims. Because we believe we were treated unjustly, we hold back forgiveness. We may hide this from ourselves, but it is not hidden from God. Being mistreated does not give us permission to hold on to an offense. Two wrongs, as my mama used to say, don't make a right. As Captain Forgiveness, I give this to you to use. I found uh, that a way to change my feelings um, and attitudes is to pray and go, God, help me to see this person or this situation the way you see it. Help me, God, to remove any falsehood. Reveal the truth, God, where I am wrong, where I am straying, God, show me. I want to see God as you see. Use that prayer. He honors that. I had a person early on uh, in my ministry um, who was uh, extremely cantankerous. He was 
just mean across the board, but it just, for me, it seems like he really was targeting me in particular. I, I cringed every time I saw him. What's he going to pick on me now for? And um, I prayed. I prayed that prayer, and God honored it. And a few days later, uh, the man walked in my office, and, and normally instead of, you know, cringing, I didn't cringe at all. I, he walked in, and I was just at complete peace. And, and he sat down, and, and instead of hearing meanness, I saw as God saw him. I saw a man who just wanted to be loved, a, God, a man who just wanted to be part of something special. I saw a man whose earthly father had taught him how to deal with people and situations meanly. It wasn't about condoning his behavior or excusing it. It wasn't about who was right in the situation. It was about caring enough to forgive. My feelings had to change, and God helped me to do it, and he will help you as well. Holding an offense against another separates us from God. Mark 11:25 says, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Our hearts must soften and our attitudes must change regarding the offense. We must choose to see as God sees. He requires us to forgive so that we can be forgiven ourselves. The deeper the offense, the more we need God to help us to do this. But put this in perspective, regardless of the offense that you're undergoing, there is nothing, no offense remotely compares to what Jesus took on for us. I'm not saying it's easy. Hurts go down to our core. But I am saying it's required as a Christian Let's go on to the next one. We let go of negative emotions, such as vengefulness. Uh, we let go of getting mad and getting even, withdrawing, blaming, rallying others to our side. While tempting, each of these responses to offense are not in line with God's desires. It's easy to blame someone else for your problems and imagine how much better off we'd be if they weren't around. But no one but God holds our destiny. No man, no woman, child, or devil can ever get us out of the will of God. If you stay free from offense, you will stay in the will of God. If you become offended, you will be taken captive by the enemy to fulfill his purpose and will. So take your pick. Which will it be? I recommend staying submitted to God, resisting the devil by not becoming offended. The dream or vision for your life will probably happen differently than you think it will. But his word and promise will not fail. Disobedience is the only thing that can abort God's plan. In my prior corporate life, there was a time uh, when the uh, CEO of the company changed hands. And that new CEO brought in all of his um, closest circle. And the culture changed. It became real nasty and real ugly. They pitted the executives against each other, seemingly for sport. The business trips often turned into drunken sleaze fests. I was so offended, I was disgusted, I was hurt. It was a really, really difficult time. And as a Christian woman, how was I going to handle that? What was I going to do? Well, what I did was I remembered who I was working for. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. I let go of the offense with God's help. I worked hard and in a manner that stayed true to my character. God led me out of that in a way I had never imagined. I never would have foresaw. And he led me here. He had a purpose for my life and he has a purpose for your life. And people cannot thwart that plan for me or for you. Keep that perspective regardless of the offense. A believer filled with God's love sows his love and refuses to take the bait of offense. And yes, we are baited. But whenever we give love, we sow the spirit and we will eventually reap the harvest of love. We may not know how that love will be manifested, but we can trust that it will come. 
Romans 12, 17 through 19 says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceable with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. It's, jo- it's God's job to correct. Refuse the urge to be God. Refuse to take up an offense. Only God has the right to judge and avenge. We must not take the prerogatives of God into our own hands. It is wrong to do the right thing the wrong way. Yes, wrongs need to be addressed, but by the right person at the right time in the right manner with the right motive, God's timing. We must not let our emotions direct us in ways that will separate us from God. The words we choose matter. The way we handle things matter. Regardless of what someone else has done or is doing, we have, the, we have to answer to our own behaviors. We need to do what honors God. I heard a story recently. It was a story of a man who was attending a wor- worship service. I'm sorry, I'm picking on men, so I'll change it. It was a woman um, <laughs> in a worship service, and she disagreed with the theology of the preacher. And she got up in the middle of the worship service and just screamed and how dare you and started cursing and calling names and storming out and walking out and and if you think about that it's like even if it was bad theology what kind of witness was that two wrongs don't make a right we have to answer to our behavior withdrawal is harmful too that's my go-to place I could give Mike and Jamie the silent treatment for days, days. I'm getting, I'm getting better. I'm getting better. In difficult situations, we need to learn to lean on and to trust and to hear directly from God. Rather than face difficulties and maintain hope, we may run to where it appears to be no conflict. The grass is always greener someplace else. But let's face it, Jesus is the only perfect person. If we run, we may fail to receive what God has for us. We add offense on top of offense. We sow negative seeds and spiritual barrenness wherever we go. They say, the teacher hates me. I'm going to just drop that class. I'm mad at my boss. I'm going to quit that job. I don't like what the preacher did or didn't do. I'm leaving that church. I'm mad at my spouse. I want a divorce. We have to stop running. We are not called to react people or situations. We're called to act obediently in response to God. Here is where we mature, where we refine, where we strengthen. We grow in our attitudes and our thoughts and our emotions so as to avoid taking up the fence. That's where we gain our forgiveness muscles. Any thought process or heart attitude that is rooted in selfishness or pride will be shaken and purged. This can be a good thing. This shapes us into the character of Jesus if we let it. We can choose to learn from this or we can choose to fight it. If we pass the test of humility, our roots will shoot down deeper, stabilizing us and our future. For Mike and Jamie's situation, I should turn to God, perhaps cry to God, say, hurt my feelings, should read my Bible until he readies my heart to respond. For me, There's a difference between processing and withdrawing. When I process, I'm letting go of the offense. I'm talking to God. When I'm withdrawing, I'm holding on to the offense. The next one. This is the last one for forgiveness, and it's a toughie, with an increased ability to wish the offender well. Let's go straight to God's word on this one. Luke 6, 27 through 29, But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on the cheek, turn to him the other also. Luke 6, 36, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Luke 6, 37, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Matthew 18, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but 70 times seven. 
Recall with forgiveness, we're not talking about condoning, excusing, pardoning, forgetting, or even reconciling yet. The offense was real. The hurt is real. The offender may not even realize that they offended. You may or may not ever get an apology. Forgiveness isn't about the offender. It's about us. There's freedom and power in honestly praying blessings over the person who offended. These aren't prayers like, God, help him get what he deserves. You know, it isn't reading God's word and using it as a weapon. It's not building the case for the, against the offender. They're prayers like, God, help me forgive Mike and Jamie for hurting me. God, help me desire blessings for Mike and Jamie. I know I need to, but I'm hurt. Help me to desire to pray for them. Or God, I lift up Mike and Jamie and pray blessings over them, that they know you, that they love you, that they're walking close to you, that they're in good health, that they have financial blessings, that they get good grades on their tests, that they're favored at work. I just pray, Lord, blessings over all of them. And God, whatever I've done to harm them, Lord, I pray for healing and reconciliation and all of that in the name of Jesus. We're praying earnestly for them, for our offender. Reading God's word, not for a weapon, but really reading God's word for his heart and his spirit, helps us to hear the truth from God and allows us to hear others without being or continuing to be offended. These steps may happen quickly or over a period of time. They may need to be restarted over and over until full healing occurs. To determine if you're healed, ask this. Can the offender's name mentioned or the side of that person go from this part of your head to this part of your head without getting stuck right here? I'm borrowing that from a, a wise man. It's incredibly difficult to hate someone you are earnestly praying for. Getting hate out of our hearts heals us. Forgiving others is a requirement of being Christian. We remember what we said earlier in Matthew 6, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So we've gone through this. We've gone through the steps. We've forgiven the offense. But so far, the other person hasn't even been involved. Forgiveness is for us. It's for our health and for our walk with God. Reconciliation is something a little different. Reconciliation is beyond forgiveness. It restores relationships. As a Christian, we seek to be reconciled not for our own sakes alone, but for our offender's sake. We can become a catalyst to help him or her out of the offense. The love of God does not permit us to allow him to remain angry without attempting to reach out to him in restoration. Remember, rippling could be going on. Eternity is at stake. Nothing in the world is more important than someone's right relationship with God, our creator. We have, may have done nothing wrong. Right or wrong isn't the point. <coughs> Excuse me. It is more important for us to help the stumbling brother or sister than to prove ourselves correct. We approach not for condemnation, but for reconciliation. This is the way God uses to restore us to himself. Though we have sinned against God, he demonstrates his own love toward and for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8. Are we willing to lay down our self-protection and die to pride in order to be restored to the one who has offended us? God reached out to us before we even asked for forgiveness. Jesus decided to forgive us before we even acknowledged our offense. We need to do the same, but how do we do that? For all starters, let's pray. We pray for openings. We pray for openness. We pray for soft hearts. We pray for opportunities. We pray. We listen actively. We want to really hear. We want to seek to understand. We're not listening so that we can figure out what our comeback is. We're listening. We want to get to the root of it. We want to understand what the root issue is. We avoid defensiveness. That's a roadblock. We ask forgiveness for what we really are sorry for. We take responsibility for any piece of it. It could be the offense itself or it could be the hurt that the offense unintentionally caused. I may learn after talking to Mike and Jamie 
that they were calling me crazy and cray cray because they were upset at what I had just asked them to all do for Thanksgiving. In listening, I may find out that I asked them to do something at a time when Jamie had to work or Mike was committed for a, a worship ministry with Celebrate Recovery. They could have been upset with the menu that I chose because they're dieting and don't like I needed to listen to hear why they were upset with me. It wasn't about the words and harmful things that they said about me. We wanted to seek to understand. I don't have to have an apology from them. I don't really even have to ask for an apology from them. It may happen, I may do so, but that's really not the first thing that happens in this conversation. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with men, Romans 12, 18. There are times when others will refuse to be at peace with us. Or there may be those that, who demand conditions for reconciliation that would compromise our relationship with God. The scripture says, but as much as it depends on you, our requirement is to try and not to give up too soon. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers will confront and love, bringing truth so that the resulting reconciliation will endure, that it will last. The peacemaker will not maintain an artificial or superficial relationship. That's not good enough for God. Peacemakers desire openness, truth, and love. Peacemakers refuse to hide offense with a political smile. Peacemakers make peace with a bold love that cannot fail. Captain Forgiveness salutes you. Go and be peacemakers, and let's live it.